Greetings from Chicagoland in the United States. My name is Peter Denda. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University. Alex and Connor are my students. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is our work on spying on the floating point behavior of existing unmodified scientific applications. So this is the talk in a nutshell. These are the things I want you to take away from this talk. First, uh, IEEE floating point has numerous gotchas. So we know this. There's previous work that raises concerns about users and codes as a consequence of these gotchas. And there's growing development tool support to basically handle these gotchas and to improve codes. So what we bring to the table is this tool called FPSpy. And the majority of this talk is going to, going to be about its design and implementation. And the point of FPSpy is to try to record as close as possible to the production level, to record issues in existing unmodified application binaries, binaries, not source code, not middle level code, etc., but binaries as they run. So FPSpy is a user level open source tool that can do this. And it's agnostic to languages that are chosen for these applications, or in, indeed multiple languages. Um, it's also agnostic to parallelism, the model of parallelism that is used in the application. So we contend that these allow you to monitor applications, scientific applications, at large scale as they run. And as a proof of concept of that, we apply FPSpy to about 10 million lines of code from various scientific applications and benchmarks. So this is the outline of the talk. So I'm going to dwell deeper into the motivation and the related work, uh, enumerate the goals of FPSpy, and then go into its design and implementation as a consequence of those goals. Then I'll talk a little bit about the performance of this tool, the overhead. Um, then I'll go into this study of these applications and benchmarks, again, this 10 million lines of code. So we also use FPSpy not just to find issues in applications, but also to characterize, app, uh, characterize the workloads, for example, rounding. And we have ongoing work to try to do rounding mitigation that is informed by the workload characterization that we can derive from FPSpy. So, floating point. So, floating point is a challenging beast. So, it looks like real number arithmetic or possibly scientific notation arithmetic, but it is emphatically not that. Um, floating point is everywhere, right? So, of course, in the sciences, we know this, in engineering, we know this been true for decades, but it's also true in other domains such as the military um, and other places where consequential decisions are being made, not just in pure science. And it's growing. So for example, AI, machine learning, is a quickly trending upward user of floating point. There's very little training that people get in terms of floating point. So even computer science students get maybe a week of training in a typical program. And one thing to realize that's very different from the training that, that people my age may have gotten when they were undergraduates or graduate students is that there's typically not a course where students learn about numerical methods. So this is not common in most education processes for computer science these days. So as a consequence, people rely on their intuition for maths, or math if you like, and unfortunately this intuition is often wrong. And if that is not the worst thing, what's happening now is everything is changing. So we're seeing architectural changes, changes in comp compilers and optimizations. We're seeing alternative number systems such as posits and unums show up that are radically potentially breaking existing code because of changes. So there's a number of related work items that I can mention. Um, these are the ones that are uh, expounded on in more detail in the paper. So first of all, there is, of course, a, a large uh, computational reproducibility push among the U.S. federal government um, and other governments. So we have ourselves studied developer understanding of floating point properties. Uh, there's a paper in IPDPS 2018 that I would like to encourage you to read. Uh, within HPDC, we've seen publications last year on the uh, CESM incident um, that, uh, that, that NCAR had to deal with. Um, and their response. Uh, so this was all based around um, the sudden use of this, uh, this, this, this instruction called multiply add. Um, we've also seen work uh, on compiler-induced variants, in particular FLIT system, 
which can basically try to bulletproof uh, source code by compiling it numerous different ways and seeing if the outputs vary. And if they do, do vary, tracking down to the parts of the code which are affected by those uh, compiler, that compiler induced variants. And of course, there's a large range of other things that I mentioned here in other, do in other domains. So the goals of FPSpy um, and to slot it into this, this, uh, this existing work. Uh, so one of the big things that we're trying to do here um, is we're trying to operate at full scale on unmodified application binaries. And in fact, our vision is to allow us to use this tool in a production setting, to slide it underneath a real job run in a production supercomputer and use it to determine what's happening with that actual run. And so as a consequence, we need to be able to support parallelism, distributed memory and shared memory forms, MPI and OpenMP, for example. The other thing is we cannot rely on kernel changes, and we cannot rely on code transformations, right? These are scientific instruments that we're trying to measure. Um, and when we do that, we cannot perturb them, right? So we're only using user level features. There are no kernel changes, and we try to perturb, perturb only the timing of applications, not anything else. Finally, some applications and frameworks um, will use uh, the features that we use in order to, to uh, improve their own behavior or to track their own problems. So when that happens, when the application uses features that we use, we need to get out of the way and we need to do this in a graceful way. We cannot simply abort the application or something like that that would be completely intolerable. We need to gracefully shut down and allow the application to continue to run. So finally, like any other tool that does measurement of a program, there's going to be overhead. Um, FPSpy is no different, um, and the overhead can be consequential. So we want to provide a mechanism where the user can decide to trade off between the amount of overhead and the information that is gathered. So FPSpy builds on top of hardware and software prerequisites. So in particular, it builds on top of the IEEE floating point standard, which defines a range of conditions that we can detect. Um, we target the x64, the x86 64-bit architecture, which has an implementation of the standard in the form of sticky condition codes, in the form of the ability to generate exceptions when these conditions happen. And we also take advantage of a feature of x86 that's not strictly necessary, but it's called trap mode. This allows us to do single-step execution to avoid breakpointing. So we also build on top of Linux. Um, in particular, we build on top of the LD preload shared library interposition mechanism. We build on top of a set of signals that, uh, that, that Linux provides and the context that's provided to the signal handler. We also build on top of a fairly Linux-specific thing, which is per thread timers, but that's only necessary um, when, when FBSpy is used in a particular way. So what do I mean by hardware detection? So this is a figure from Intel, from the Intel manuals, Intel processor manuals, and it describes this MXCSR control status register. So there's a lot of detail here. Don't worry about it. There's a bunch of bits. My point here is that there's a bunch of bits that are the condition code bits, which track what happens when you run an apple, when you run a floating point instruction. There are side of, the condition codes are set as a side effect instruction. And then there's a set of bits that, are, that do what are called exception control. And the idea of exception control is that when one of those bits changes, when one of those condition codes changes, it can generate an exception, hardware level exception, which can be ultimately delivered, be delivered to user level. So given these, this hardware mechanism, which again is IEEE specific, it's not, we're using an instantiation of that on the x86, but these are concepts from the IEEE standard. So given, we can detect these six hardware conditions on an x86. So inexact, rounding, underflow, overflow, overflow means you're generating infinity, denormalized numbers, divide by zero, and also invalid, which indicates that something you're operating on is not, in fact, a number, which is usually a, a very bad sign. So an important thing to realize here is the hardware is always doing this, whether we are looking at it or not. There's no overhead for the hardware to detect these events, no additional overhead. And the stickiness property of the condition code bits allow us to basically do a zero overhead detection when we're looking for one or more occurrences of an event. So we can't consider each occurrence individually. But with exceptions, we can consider each, each occurrence individually. 
And so what we can do with exceptions, we can actually do instruction granularity detection. So we can say this instruction caused this event. So FBSpy. So it's an LD preload library, and you know, there's plenty of material on that, so I'm not going to go into depth on it. Um, it interposes on the kernel library functionality. So the reason why it does this, however, is not to change that functionality, but to detect when the application or the library is trying to use that functionality. And when that happens, it gets out of the way gracefully. So it's a tool that follows forks and thread creations, so it intercepts those and basically hands them in a special way. As a consequence, uh, if, you have, if, you generate, if you run a program and it generates multiple other processes or other threads, we track them individually. So every single thread in the program generates basically a trace of what's happening in that thread. And we also control this entirely with environmental variables, which means that we can drop it into something like MPI run. So we can handle, using these mechanisms, we can handle both um, uh, shared memory parallelism like OpenMP and distributed memory parallelism like MPI. And the intent is to make it, not the, the actuality, is that it's as easy to use as this example. So if you have some command line of any kind, you can add basically a set of environment variables before the command, the same command, and FPSpy will spy on that application. All right, so FPSpy can operate in one of two modes. So there's something called aggregate mode, which is very simple, and this just detects that the event happened at least once, and this is zero overhead. And then there's individual mode, which is where the complexity lies, and this can potentially record every event that occurs in every instruction. And we need to control the overhead of this when we use it. So this is a system diagram, which I am not going to, uh, which I'm not going to read to you. Um, for those who are watching the video, you can pause here and look at more, more depth. There's more detail in the paper. The main point here is that the meat of this 2,000 line program um, is this individual mode, which operates like a trap and emulate virtual machine monitor, okay, with instruction emulation being via hardware single stepping, and every single thread or process in the program generates a separate trace. So individual mode has two mechanisms to control its overhead. So one is filtering by event type. So an interesting thing here is that rounding in exacts is a common aspect of floating point. It doesn't mean the program has gone bad, right? And because of that, the floating point uh, in exacts tend to dominate the events that we actually find. So if you're not interested in rounding operation or rounding happening, you can filter these out, and that dramatically reduces the overhead. So we can also sample by time. Here we can basically say we're going to turn on and off FPSpy um, at random intervals and with random durations um, through a process called Poisson sampling. And this allows us to basically do to capture random samples of the events that occurs. And this is a way that we can capture in exacts in a in a somewhat scalable way, or in a somewhat low overhead way. So these both work by reducing the probability that an instruction that causes an event will actually be trapped by the system. If it's not trapped, the overhead is zero. All right, so here are some, uh, some examples of overhead. So here we're running a program called mini Arrow, which I'm going to describe a little bit later. Um, we're looking on the vertical axis, the execution time of this. We're looking at the horizontal axis. Each set of bars is a different configuration. The rightmost, uh, sorry, the leftmost set of bars is basically the benchmark without uh, FPSpy involved at all. Then the next set is basically using aggregate mode, and as I mentioned, the overhead is zero. Then we're using individual mode with trace with filtering. We're we're looking at all the faulting instructions except the ones that are doing rounding, and the overhead of that is essentially almost zero. Then the fourth set of bars is, is a situation where we're sampling 5% of all instructions, um, and we're also detecting situations where rounding occurs. And as you can see, the overhead here is higher, and a lot of the overhead is occurred in the, in the kernel, in system time, um, because essentially we're generating more exceptions and generating more, more signals for the program. So these four sets of bars are what we use in the study in this paper. We also looked at higher rates in the study, but a very important thing to realize here is that the overhead of this thing in, in individual mode is very dependent on the workload's event rate. And as a consequence, you, how it's configured and how those events happen in the workload is really what tells you 
what determines the, the slowdown. So the worst case slowdown we saw in our study was 127x, and that's individual mode tracing with sampling. We're trying to capture the rounding behavior. All right, so let's evaluate FP spy. How do we do this? So first of all, we constructed a set of examples and where we know the ground truth, and we basically check, can FP spy find that ground truth? Yes. So we also looked at a range of applications and benchmarks, and well, we don't know the ground truth for these programs, but we were basically evaluating FP spy in terms of um, is it able to operate in the context of these real larger scale applications and benchmarks? So I should say there's a bunch of caveats I'm going to give you here. So one is that we're not making claims about the correctness of these applications. We are not making claims about um, problems in these applications. What we're saying is that we found some possible issues. Our main point with this study is to evaluate how well FP Spy can operate in these production-like environments. All right. So these are the applications and benchmarks we looked at. So the benchmark suites are, are NAS and Parsec, which are very widely used. But then in addition to those, we have, and beyond mini era, we have LAMPS, LAGOS, Moose, WRF, and ENZO. So five of these applications are in the top 20 codes that run on the NSF Exceed resources by time. So these are very widely used, uh, very widely used code bases. And as you can see from the last column, these code bases are huge and they vary across numerous languages. So for example, C++, C, Fortran, etc. All right, so what does it look like? What is the output of something like this look like? So we take these applications, these examples from these applications or frameworks, we run them in our environment, and we run them in aggregate mode, and we see something like this. So here, the table I'm showing you here, red obviously, red T means basically something bad happened or the event happened. Um, uh, vertically, we're seeing the different applications or benchmarks. Horizontally, sorry, vertically, we're seeing the different um, events, such as divided by zero and valid. Uh, horizontally, we're seeing the different applications. Let's flip that around. Horizontally, we are seeing the different events. Vertically, we're seeing the different applications. So this is an aggregate mode, zero overhead. WRF is a special case. The point I want to make here is that the highlighted uh, situations are potentially bad things that we detect, right? So you would not expect a divide by zero in a scientific application. You would not expect an invalid in something like Enzo. You would not expect an overflow in, in most things. So we detect these. So here we run the same thing, but we run it in individual mode. Now here, you notice that this table is different slightly, and that's because we're running in individual mode, but we're sampling only 5% of instructions. So we cannot, we're not trapping all the same instructions, but we are trapping the inexacts, the, the rounding. So again, I've highlighted some scenarios, some situations here, which seem problematic. Again, divide by zero, invalids, overflows. Here, what we're doing is we're saying, all right, we're gonna run in this individual mode. We're gonna look at every instruction, but we're, we're going to look, in this case, every instruction, all 100%, not 5%, but we're going to filter out the rounding behavior to make this tractable, right, and to make the overhead sane, okay? And we still see interesting kinds of behaviors, right? So now we can, we clearly see divide by zero. We clearly see instructions that, uh, like an Enzo, which could generate NANs, we clearly see overflows. All right. So we can also dig deeper in this mode, in this individual mode, because we're trapping individual instructions that cause these events. So this is an example. So this is that ENZO application, astrophysics application, which is generating uh, NANDs. And what we're doing here is we're seeing the rate of NAND generation in this application as a function of time. So on average, there's about eight NANDs per second being produced in, by this application, which seems somewhat problematic. And this is the level of detail that you can get out of, out of FP spot. All right, so now I'm going to turn the page and say, beyond trying to investigate the uh, properties of applications, the, the potential, potential issues in applications, what if we try to improve applications? And one thing that we are looking at improving is rounding. 
So rounding again is a part is part and parcel of floating point arithmetic, and it's a consequence of the fact that the floating point unit has much wide, much higher precision internally than it can store. And as a consequence, it has to be rounding to store into memory or register. Can we do better? We're looking at building a rounding mitigation system. And like any system design, we need workload, we need to do a workload characterization to understand how this system might actually work. So a rounding mitigation system would basically try to avoid rounding by, by by escaping to higher precision. So this is a detail of what an individual mode trace looks like. And I know there's a lot of stuff in here, but this is me running a Perl script that basically slices apart the, the, the binary mode trace that we get, and uh, every, every row in this, this, uh, this output consists of a timestamp, the event that happened, FLT res basically means rounding, it tells us the instruction address, it tells us the stack pointer, it tells us the particular fault codes and the kernel perspective and the hardware perspective. And very importantly, highlighted in yellow, it tells us the instruction that caused the event, in particular the 15 bytes at rib. So this is the workload for our binary rounding mitigation system. Right? So what does this tell us about the prospect for such a system? So I'm just going to show one figure for this. Um, and this is a rank popularity graph. So what we're doing here is we're saying, let's take those instructions, the forms of those instructions, adds, multiplies, divides, etc., and generate them, generate a graph that basically uh, ranks them by their popularity. Or the histogram by popularity is what's going on here. So horizontal axis is the popularity, zero is most popular, 30 is the 30th most popular, the vertical axis is the number of such instructions that occur in our traces. And an important thing to realize here is that for almost all of our codes, about 20 of these instruction forms cover all the faulting instructions that we see, with Gromax being an exception. But again, it's not that much an exception. It's about 45. So what this suggests that an a, a, a rounding mitigation system that's based on instruction decoding and emulation or code generation is potentially very is considerably can be considerably simplified because it has to consider a much smaller set of possible uh, instruction formats. So I remind you that on a machine like this, there are literally hundreds of floating point instructions. Twenty of them seem to be enough for, mo for many of the applications that we that we actually encounter. So, uh, in terms of work in progress, we are working on such a system uh, that we call FPVM. And the idea of FPVM is it will allow us to dynamically replace floating point with alternative arithmetic. So for example, you might replace it with arbitrary precision floating point, and that would allow you to avoid rounding, and the extreme never round at all if you have enough memory. Um, so another examples would be rational arithmetic, fractal floats, other things that, that people have discussed. Um, and similar to FPSPY, our goal here is to make this something that can slide underneath an existing unmodified application binary. So going back to the uh, popping the stack back to, to what this talk is about. So this is the slide I started with. And these are the point, points I want you to take away from this. Right? So one is that this IEEE floating point standard has a lot of gotchas. Um, I've showed you a tool, FPSPY, which tries to capture the effects of those gotchas. Um, and it's different from existing tools because it is goal, its goal is to target these existing unmodified application binaries and to be agnostic to language, parallelism, etc. And I showed you a proof of concept study where we applied FPSPY to very large scale codes. So if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Um, FBSpy is, is available from our website. Um, thank you.